Welcome back. In this section, we'll be talking about inequalities, specifically linear inequalities. In a future chapter, we'll talk about inequalities involving rational functions and polynomials. Uh, but for now, just the basics of inequalities and also interval notation. When we're describing an inequality, and that's any statement that involves less thans or greater thans or less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, that would be something where we can express our solutions either as using that inequality or using what's called interval notation. So the idea with interval notation is, number one, we express the set of values we're interested in by giving the lower bound, comma, the upper bound. So if we wanted to talk about all the numbers between 5 and 7, we would say 5, comma, 7. And the kind of bracket that we use depends on whether we're including those endpoints. If 5 is included, it would be a square bracket. If 5 was not included, it would be a round bracket. And same thing for 7. If it were included or not, that will depend on, or that will tell whether the bracket should be a square bracket for including or round for not including. If we're just thinking about an interval that goes from a number onwards, so for example, if you're thinking all the numbers that are larger than 5, those would be numbers from 5 all the way to the far right. And whether we include the 5 or not, that'll depend on whether we write it with a square bracket or a round bracket. For the unbounded side of our interval, the side that's going to infinity, we always use a round bracket. And that's because infinity isn't actually a number. It's a concept of limitlessness, something that's as large as we'd like it to be, but no upper bound. So since that's not actually a number, then we can't include it in the same way that you could include 5. So what we're going to be doing here is taking these intervals that are being expressed as inequalities and we're going to write them in interval notation and we're also going to show the interval on the real number line. Uh, so for showing it on the real number line, there's a couple of ways that you can do it. One of them, again, using square brackets versus round brackets to show something being included versus not included. So, for example, if we're thinking about this first one, which is all the values between 2 and 5, 2 is included, x is greater than or equal to 2, and 5 is included, x is less than or equal to 5. So these would be all the values from 2 to 5, including the 2, and also including the 5. That's one way that we could express it in, uh, in a number line, drawing it on a real number line with round brackets and square brackets. We can also show it on the number line, instead of using brackets, using dots, either a filled in dot or a hollow circle. So if I wanted to show including the 2, that would be a filled in circle. And including the 5, that would be a filled in circle and the interval between the 2 and 5, so the line connecting those two dots. That would be another way that I could show that interval. And as far as interval notation goes, I would say, well, these are the numbers from 2 to 5. We're including the 2, so square brackets around it, and we're including the 5, so square brackets around it as well. For the next one up, we've got between 3 and 6, so for interval notation, it's always from the smaller number to the larger number. We are not including the 3, so round bracket. We are including the 6, so square bracket. So we could show that on our number line in the same way. Everything between 3 and 6, including the 6, not including the 3. Or if we didn't want to do it with... Uh, brackets, we could have a filled in circle for the 6 and a hollow circle for the 3 to show that the 3 is not included but the 6 is included.
All right, we've got between negative 1 and 4, not including either endpoint. So as an interval, negative 1 to negative 4 round brackets for both. And that would mean as a number line, we could say round bracket from negative 1 up to round bracket to positive 4. Mm -hmm. Or, equivalently, you could say, instead of drawing it with round brackets, we could say hollow circle for the negative 1, hollow circle for the 4, we're not including either of them, and then the line segment connecting the two. For x being less than or equal to 2, so this would be something where 2 is the largest value, so it'll be going from 2 all the way to the far left, there's no lower bound. So from negative infinity to 2, round brackets as always around our infinities, square bracket around the 2 because the 2 is included. And so if I wanted to show that on my number line, I could draw a square bracket for the 2 and show that it goes on forever by putting a little arrow on it. So here, the arrowhead on the far left is showing that that interval continues forever in that direction, that we go from to as far to the left as we'd like to go. You could also, again, same thing that we did previously, use a filled-in circle rather than a square bracket for the two to show that two is included. And same thing for the last one. If x is larger than 3, then we're going for all values larger than 3. So from 3, not including 3, all the way to the far right, which we could draw as an arrow beginning at 3 with a hollow circle and going to the far right with an arrow. Or if we didn't want to use the circle notation, we could use the round bracket notation and say round bracket at three going forever to the right. I'm not going to be drawing number lines all the time. Sometimes I'll use them just to sort of help myself out thinking about things, but for the most part when we're solving things we'll be giving our solutions in either interval notation or set notation. And we're going to talk about both of those as we go a little bit further. Before we do that, of course, we have to talk about how we solve inequalities. And so a couple of properties for inequalities. Um, I have all of these expressed in terms of less thans, but the same properties also hold, or equivalent properties also hold when we're talking about greater than, or less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to. The overall theme here is that for inequalities, we can, for the most part, treat them the same way we would treat an equation. So if you had an inequality and you added a constant amount to both sides of the equation, it's the same inequality. Or if you were to subtract the same amount from both sides of the inequality, the direction for the inequality still remains the same. If you have an inequality and you've got some constant that's positive, you could multiply both sides by it or divide both sides by it and the direction for the inequality stays the same. The only place where the direction for the inequality can change would be if we had something that was a negative value. So if you have an inequality and you multiply by something negative, that will change the direction of the inequality. It'll change it from a less than to a greater than or from a greater than to a less than. And the same is also true when we're dividing by a number that's negative. That will change the direction of our inequality as well. Change it from greater than to less than, or from less than to greater than. A couple of other nice little properties to have. 4 and 5. 4 is a nice property involving reciprocals. If you happen to know that something is negative then its reciprocal has to be negative as well. And that's not a big surprise. If you have a positive number and you flip it, it stays positive. If you have a negative number and you flip it, it stays negative. And that's what this property is telling us. Negative numbers have negative reciprocals. Positive numbers have positive reciprocals. 
And five is mostly useful just for rewriting uh, an inequality, that if you wanted to switch the order of your two numbers, so putting one thing on the left side and one thing on the right, switching that up, then that would also involve changing the direction of your inequality. If A is less than B, then B is greater than A. So the moral of the story here is that when we're solving an inequality, for the most part, we'll treat it the same way that we treat any e equation. We can add constant amounts to both sides or multiply both sides by a constant or divide. We'll just need to be careful that if we have something where our constant that we're multiplying by is negative, then the direction of our inequality will change. This also means, and this is a follow-up conclusion, if you have an inequality and you want to multiply by something and you don't know whether it's positive or negative, that's a problem. So, for example, if I have 3 over x minus 1 greater than 5, and you decide that you wanted to clear out this fraction by multiplying both sides of the equation by x minus 1, that's kind of a problem because if x minus 1 is positive, this will stay as a greater than sign. But if x minus 1 actually turns out to be negative, then this would have to change to a less than sign. And if you don't know what x is, then there would be no way for you to tell whether x minus 1 is positive or negative. So we'll have to be a little bit careful here when we're thinking about modifying our inequalities. So let's start out with solving this first problem. This first one, 2x plus 3 greater than 4. And we're going to answer our question in both ways, set notation and also interval notation. So starting out with the solving side of things, first I'll bring the 3 to the other side. So in other words, subtracting 3 from both sides of my inequality. That doesn't change the direction. And solving for x by dividing both sides by 2, that also does not change the direction. So it looks like x needs to be greater than a half. So if we're thinking about our solutions, the set notation would be this. Number one, it's a set, so we'll need curly brackets. And in set notation, typically we start that off with, it's the set of all x such that. The little vertical line that we have there, we'll read that as meaning such that or with the property that. And then on the right side of that vertical line, I'll put in what is the little condition that I have for x, and that's x needs to be greater than a half. So that would be the way that I'd write in set notation. My solutions are the set of all x such that x is greater than a half. In interval notation, this is the one that I generally like to write my answers in because it's a little bit more compact. Interval notation could be written as just, it's the numbers larger than a half, so going from a half, not including the half, all the way to the far right. Let's do a little bit more solving. So for the first one here on the, the top of the page, you could expand the left side if you want to. That's something, of course, that you could do. So you could say, well, we've got negative 2x plus 2. And I didn't multiply or divide both sides of the equation by anything, so I don't have to worry about changing the direction. It still stays as a less than or equals 2. I can subtract 2 from both sides of the equation which doesn't change the direction. But when I divide both sides of the equation by negative 2, that's going to change it from a less than or equals 2 into a greater than or equals 2. So x will be greater than or equal to negative 5 halves. So your solutions are, you could say the set of all x, such that x is greater than or equal to 5 halves negative. Or you could state your solutions as the interval notation going from negative 5 halves all the way to the far right, including the negative 5 halves.
All right, for the next problem, we've got ourselves three over, oh, sorry, five over three x minus two greater than zero. And this is where I'll use that property that if you happen to know something is greater than zero, in other words, you happen to know that it's positive, well, that means it's reciprocal should also be positive. And I could clear out that fraction by multiplying both sides of the equation by 5. And since I'm multiplying both sides by positive 5, then that means the direction for my inequality still stays as greater than. I can add 2 to both sides. Again, it still stays as a greater than. I could divide by 3. That's a positive number, so it still stays as a greater than. So x needs to be greater than 2 thirds. So as a set notation, the set of all x, such that x is greater than 2 thirds. Or as interval notation, all the values that are larger than 2 thirds, not including it, all the way to the far right. Okay, so we'll do a little bit more here. This one, I'm going to expand the left side. So if I were to multiply that all out, I would have x squared plus 2x minus 8. And on the right side, x plus 3 times x plus 3 is x squared plus 6x plus 9. And even though there's some x squareds here, they all go away. If I subtract x squared from both sides of the equation, it, the x squareds are gone. And so now I'll just get to the point where I can solve for x. I'll subtract 6x from both sides of the equation. I'll add 8 to both sides of the equation. So I've got negative 4x less than or equal to 17. And then dividing both sides of the equation by negative 4, that's going to change the direction of my inequality. So x is greater than or equal to negative 17 fourths. So my solutions are either the set of all x's such that x is greater than or equal to negative 17 fourths, or in interval notation, from negative 17 fourths to the far right, including the negative 17 fourths. All right, so last thing for us to consider here in this section would be compound inequalities. And so this would be something where it's not just one quantity less than another. So just a simple inequality would be something like that. A compound inequality is when we have more than one inequality. So something like this, 3 less than negative 4x less than or equal to 9. That's a compound inequality. Now, you have a couple of different ways that you can tackle these kinds of problems. One way would be to just keep it as a compound inequality and that whatever you do to one part of the inequality you would have to do to the other parts as well. So for example you could start out with the inequality and say well I'll divide everybody by negative 4 and that means that all of my inequalities would change their direction. So from a less than to a greater than, from a less than or equal to to a greater than or equal to. And then that would allow you to solve your inequality. You could solve for x. Now, the other way that you can consider it is that a compound inequality is really two inequalities that have been glued together. When we say 3 less than negative 4x less than or equal to negative 9, we're saying that 3 needs to be less than negative 4x, and also negative 4x needs to be less than or equal to 9. So you could really split it up into two separate inequalities and say, well, I need to find the values of x that satisfy the first part and also satisfy the second part. That's what we're saying here when I say that the values of x that are in common to both solution sets are what we'd be interested in. And so really, depending on what you have, you might choose to use one approach or the other to solve a compound inequality. So for this one, I'm just going to give my answers in interval notation. 
And so to start with this, I want to solve for my values of x. And I can see here that there's only one x lying around in this inequality. It's right here in this term. And so I can already make a plan as to how I could get that x isolated. I could start off by first multiplying all sides of my inequality by 5 to clear out that denominator in that middle. And since I multiplied by a positive number, my inequalities are all still pointing in the same direction. So I've got 5 quarters less than 2 minus 3x less than or equal to 5 thirds. And now I'm going to subtract 2 from every side of the inequality. So in the middle, subtracting 2 would leave the minus 3x. And on the outer parts, 5 quarters minus 2, that's negative 3 quarters. 5 thirds minus 2, that's negative 1 third. Those subtractions, of course, I'm using my calculator to do those. It does fractions, addition, and subtraction nicely and easily. No uh, struggling there, trying to do things on the side on paper. And then last thing I want to do is solve for x. And I can do that by dividing everybody by negative 3. And of course, since I'm going to be dividing by a negative, that means my direction for my inequalities are all going to change. So negative 3 quarters divided by negative 3, that's positive 1 quarter. Negative 3x divided by negative 3, that's just x. Negative 1 third divided by negative 3, that is 1 ninth. And to make this read a little bit easier, rather than saying a quarter is bigger than x, which is larger than or equal to a ninth, I could say a ninth is less than or equal to x, which is less than a quarter. That's that last property that we had for inequalities that said if you wanted to switch the order up, that that would mean switching the direction of your inequalities as well. I'm doing that because, remember, in interval notation, we're giving our interval going from smallest value to largest value, and of those two numbers, one-ninth is the smaller one and one-quarter is the larger one. So I, if I were to write one-quarter up to one-ninth, that actually would be incorrect because one-quarter is not the smallest value. Remember that if you're thinking in terms of a number line, the number line is read from left to right. So in this case, one-ninth is where we begin on our number line, and that on our number line we would end at one-quarter, going from one-ninth to one-quarter. And as far as the kinds of brackets that we'll need to use, we're including the one-ninth, so square brackets around it. We're not including the one-quarter, so round bracket around it. So my solutions are everything from one-ninth, including the one-ninth, up to, but not including, the one-quarter. All right, one last one that I want to work through here. Uh, so for this inequality, we have the x is not in the numerator. The x is in the denominator, and that's kind of a problem for us. So there's not going to be a really easy way for me to solve for x. If you're thinking, well, why don't I just multiply everybody by x minus 3 right now, because that would get rid of your fractions. The problem is, we don't know if x minus 3 is positive or negative. If x minus 3 is positive, then all of our inequalities would stay in the same direction. But if x minus 3 were negative, then that would mean that all of our inequalities would have to change direction. And so since we don't know whether x minus 3 is positive or negative, we're going to need to find another way to solve this. So what I'm going to do is split this up into two separate inequalities. 0 needs to be less than 4 over x minus 3. And we also need 4 over x minus 3 to be less than or equal to 6. So I'm going to work with the one that's on the left, because I, in fact I know exactly what I can do with the one that's on the left. When we say 0 is less than 4 over x minus 3, in other words, we're saying this is some sort of positive amount. It's bigger than 0. That means that its reciprocal should also be positive. 
So we can actually solve. I could multiply both sides of this inequality by 4. And since we've multiplied by something positive, the inequality stays in the same direction. I can add 3 to both sides. That doesn't change the inequality. So you could say 3 is less than x, or equivalently, you could say x is bigger than 3. Okay, so how does this help me out now? Remember that when we're solving this inequality, we're going to be looking for things that satisfy both parts. That's the and. That it has to be values of x that make the left side true and also make the right side true. And so one thing that we know is x must be larger than 3 because that would be the values of x that solve the first part of our inequality. But one thing to notice, if x is larger than 3, then that means that x minus 3 would be positive. And so now if we're thinking about this, when I said at first we couldn't multiply both sides of the equation, or inequality rather, by x minus 3, and the reason we couldn't when we first started out was we didn't know if it was positive or negative, well now we know it must be positive. So that means we can multiply both sides of this inequality by x minus 3. And since x minus 3 is positive, then that inequality will still stay pointing in the same direction. So the only reason we're able to do this step is because we now know that x minus 3 must be positive. And so we can solve and find out what x needs to be. And so dividing both sides by 6, you would have 22 sixths, or same thing as 11 thirds. So x is greater than or equal to 11 thirds. So when we say 11 thirds is less than or equal to x, or you could say x is greater than or equal to 11 thirds. Now we need to start thinking about our solutions. And so for this, I'm going to just get myself a, a new blank page here so that I can draw myself a number line. I know I say that I don't use number lines to express my solutions, but I do use my number line to help me figure out what my solutions might be. So I'll just do a little hastily drawn number line here with a couple of numbers on it. So remember that we have two things that need to be true. We need number one, x needs to be greater than three. We also need x needs to be greater than or equal to 11 thirds. And so if x needs to be greater than 3, then those would be all the values to the right of 3. And at the same time, we need x to also be greater than or equal to 11 thirds. 11 thirds is the same thing as 3 and 2 thirds. And what we need is what's in common to both. Both parts need to be true. x needs to be larger than 3, and at the same time, x needs to be larger than or equal to 11 thirds. So what is in common to both would be the values of x that are greater than or equal to 11 thirds. So for this one, my solutions would be all the values of x that are 11 thirds or larger, so including the 11 thirds and moving on to the far right. So that's the one place to be careful that when we're solving a compound inequality with this approach, splitting it into two separate inequalities, we're going to have to think at the end, what are the values of x that satisfy both of our solutions? It needs to satisfy values of x to be bigger than 3, but they also need to be greater than or equal to 11 thirds. And to figure out what those values of x are, is it something that's between the two values? Is it something that's larger than the largest value? Is it something that's smaller than the smallest value? That we can figure out by drawing both in, uh, intervals 
on a number line and then figuring out, well, what do these two intervals have in common? And what they happen to have in common are the values that are 11 thirds and larger.